It is now on. Welcome everybody online. We're glad to have you here today. And if you ever watch it online, it's uh, it's on. Uh, okay, I'll get there, Kathy. It's uh, it's uh, on YouTube. Look up my name on YouTube, and you'll find all the worship services as long as everything technically goes right. It's also on our Hope Community United Methodist Facebook page, and uh, sometimes other places as well. So uh, it's never live. Uh, it happens a little bit later after I have lunch and upload it. So it's usually later the same day. Uh, I forgot to mention that we have uh, Angel Tree is a ministry we do here where we provide a gift for children whose parents are incarcerated. Uh, we, get, we received this year, I believe, uh, 22 families, 56 names, 58 names, 54 names. I'm being instructed from the back. And uh, we have a few left. So if you have a desire to be a part of that ministry, uh, Kathy, raise your hand so people can see who you are if they don't know you. And she's, uh, she's got the list. That's my wife, Kathy, in the back. And uh, we're happy to hand those out. We had restrictions at the beginning, only one per family. At this point, you can take what you want uh, as we fill in the gaps to do that ministry. All right, so we are uh, ready to start our trivia expedition this morning. Uh, so here, some of these questions are biblical. Some of these questions are tradition, and some of these questions just are about using your head for reason, because we as United Methodists believe that Scripture is essentially important, but that also it takes uh, some thought and reason. Uh, Wesley described it as, uh, as a Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Now, I don't really have any experience questions. We'll get those maybe from the answering. So Henry VIII, separated from the Church of England, uh, from the Roman Catholic Church, in part because he wanted an annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon so that he could marry this woman instead. Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn, I hear from the back. Let's see if that's correct. Now, i got to tell you, the Saturday night people got these questions really right, so you guys are on the bubble here. Well, they <laughs> All right, next question. From 1309 to 1376, the papacy moves from Rome to this city. Constantinople. It is not Constantinople. Why not? What is it? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? It's a trick question. That's the answer everybody gives. Any idea where it is? Avalon. Who said that? Avignon. You said yeah. So you got it right. It's Avignon, France. Excellent. So we see we're hey we're ahead of Saturday night already. We got two right. Next question. Why should a person living in the United States never be buried in Canada? Because they're still alive. Yeah, we don't bury live living people. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we don't. You should never bury a living person. Uh, the Bible names three sons of Adam and Eve: Cain, Abel, and. I heard it back here. I got the right answer back here, but y'all didn't hear it. And I'm not telling you. Somebody else know? Oh, come on. What was the answer, AJ? Seth. Seth is the answer. All right, so we got three out of three right so far. What prophet bought a field near Jerusalem while the city was under siege? Jeremiah. He was reclaiming the territory. John Ron said it. said, Jeremiah, you got it. That's right. There was a scripture that said he needed to own property there to reclaim, and he was reclaiming the territory. What is the name of the disciple who replaced Judas after Judas is dead? I know it's right on the tip of your tongue. Matthias. I hear it again in the back. Matthias. Oh, he's getting all of he is. He's getting the right answer. That's that's the correct answer. Two of Jesus' disciples were Simon Peter and Simon Peter's brother. What was the brother's name? John. James. James. Well, here, John. What was your answer? James. James. I don't. Uh, I don't remember. The answer is Andrew. So it wasn't John or James. Should have been. Okay, the Christian day, this Christian day is the day we commemorate the gift visit of the Magi. Easy question, you should know. 
epiphany, a mirror of that all around. On the final Sunday before Lent begins, we remember this event when Jesus' face shone like the sun and he was joined by Moses and Elijah. Transfiguration. Yeah, yeah transfiguration is correct. Okay, this is the best question of all. Adam has none, Eve has two, and everyone else has three. What is the answer? Five. Hmm? Five. I can't hear you. Thought of no, the answer is not five. Adam has none, Eve has two, everyone else has three. Jared? Names? Hmm? Names? No, it's not names. What did you say, Michelle? The letter E. The letter E. Michelle got it right. What? <laughs> no, I don't get that. <laughs> well, there's three letters in everything else. There's one, no letter E's in Adam. No, Adam has no E's. Eve has two E's. She was right. And everyone else has three. So she was right. She was right. Who's everyone else? Well, the answer is Eve. Doesn't matter how many it was. <laughs> I just get these questions out of a trivia program, so you know. Acts tells us the story of Eutychus, who falls out of a window while this man is preaching. Paul is the answer. Good job. How old does one have to be to be baptized in the United Methodist Church? Zero. Four. Zero. Zero. Four. Zero. 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 Well, here, no, that was a different question last week. <coughs> that was to come to communion. This is baptism. All right, so I'm hearing, I'm hearing zero. I don't know how you would baptize somebody that was zero because they don't exist. Um, and I'm hearing four. I don't know where that comes. The answer is one second old. No, I was right because I said four. <laughs> there is no minimum age. <laughs> no minimum age. Yeah. All right, I think that's all of our questions. So uh, today, we're now going to light the Advent wreath, and uh, maybe we are. And uh, the way we do that is there's a chorus on here that you're going to help me sing, and that's our response to the lighting. Uh, today, we light the hope candle that's on the front of your bulletin and we'll light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
chapter, and it's the 11th through the 14th verse. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone and the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And as you're able, would you stand for the affirmation of faith this morning as we affirm our faith with the old traditional uh, Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father, Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Jesus. Let me get turned here in the hymnal to it, and we're ready. Thank you. 
Well, friends, as we gather together to pray, it's my prayer this year that as we begin to understand the coming of Christ again, that we spend some time in reflection about why in the world it is that we need Christ to come again. In the ancient days, they didn't know what we know now. But what a difference it makes to have Christ a part of our lives. And what a difference it will make for those that don't know Him to learn about the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we come before You humble, broken, sometimes confused, sometimes misdirected, and sometimes just lost. Usually we come to you with a long list of things we'd like. We'd like for there to be peace. We'd like for our friends to be healed. We'd like for those dreaded diseases to be gone from this planet. We'd like for everybody to have a chance to have a good meal like on Thanksgiving. We would like for there to be housing for everyone. But we live in a world where that's just not true. So God, you've called us to be your people. Broken, sometimes failing to do our job, we come before you now humbly asking for your grace. Asking to be directed by your love so that we can become the heart and the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ for a community that needs to know him so badly. Really, times are not that much different than they were then. There was political unrest. There was religious dissension. There was sin. There was pain. And there was suffering. And yet the light of the world comes into our lives as he came into their lives then. Not what was expected. Not a big fancy leader on a white horse with a big sword and a shield, but a humble servant, so much like many of us. And sometimes we, like the disciples, wonder just how do we do this? What do we do? How do we do it? When do we do it? What do we do? And who do we do it to? Even the disciples went to Jesus and said, how do we pray? And he said, Pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In just a few minutes, I'll be inviting the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. It's one of those great times when we have the opportunity to return to God what God has blessed us with. So at this time, I would invite the ushers to come forward as we collect our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this weekend following Thanksgiving, we have been giving thanks for at least four days. And today we once again thank you for the blessings of our life. But we realize, God, that you've got work for us to do. And as we seek to live out lives in the kingdom here on earth, give us strength. Today, receive our gifts and our tithes and our offerings. And God, we count on us to use them for glorifying God in this community and throughout the whole world. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
you're done. You're not. You ready? Okay. As you're able, would you please stand? Praise God from all blessings flow. Praise Him. standing for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Matthew in the uh, 24th chapter. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. He would have not let his home be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. So I entitled this message today, Are We Really Ready? Are We Ready? You know, Advent for me over the years has been that time uh, well, different things. As a kid, you know, we had little banks. And so we would put a dime or a penny or something in that little bank for every day of Advent. And then when we got to Christmas, we would turn those into the church and they would send them off to UNICEF or something like that. Uh, I grew up in churches somewhat like this one, really, Garden Villas United Methodist, or Garden Villas Methodist, later it was United, Trinity Methodist in Beaumont, uh, Deer Park Methodist here, Laporte Methodist here, and, and of course this church. And, and my experience was that so many times we Methodists thought that mission work was done by writing a check. When I came here, they had banners all across the back walls that they were a global services church. They had done this, they had done that, but the mission field for them was done by writing a check. And, and I think uh, sometimes when we get to Advent, it takes more than writing a check. When I ask you, are you ready? Well, what does it mean to be an Advent? It's a time where I used to look at it, it's the time when we look forward to the coming of Jesus. And I think that's still true. But more than that, what I would like to think about now is why does the world need Jesus Christ? That's kind of globally. Why does our community need Jesus Christ? Why does our church need Jesus Christ? And then why do I need Jesus Christ? I mean, I've already been to the front of the church. I've said my vows. I'm a member. Why do I need Christ? Well, let me tell you, I did those things, but I'm far from perfect. There needs to be life-changing transformation within me, and I'm sure that's true of all of us. And we got to look now at a time where in, in four weeks, Plus, we're going to have Jesus Christ come for Christmas. We're going to celebrate Christmas. And most of us are involved in a world where they've been putting up Christmas trees and Christmas stockings and Christmas balls and lights and decorations since Halloween. We go right from Halloween, then to Thanksgiving, and jump to Christmas, and we forget about a time of expectation and hope and reflection and change. It kind of worries me, really, that Christmas is so much moved to this celebration of gifts and parties, and trees and lights. And I think the reason it's that way is because we live in a world where they don't really think about Jesus coming or what difference it'll make in, in your life or, or why haven't. I submit to you that every one of you has an experience somewhere in your life where one day you realize, man, I sure needed Jesus. And it wasn't just when you had a wish list. In fact, just like Jesus comes into the world in this kind of weird family situation, being born in a manger, Jesus comes into our lives the same ways. It very seldom happens from the front of the church with the preacher. It can. I've actually seen a few cases of it. It very seldom happens in Sunday school or Bible study. What happens is things happen in our lives and we realize 
that we need Jesus Christ. Now, what worries me is we live in a world where there's a lot of people that that's not on their mind. They don't think about it at all. You know, I'm aware that as you get older, it's easier to think about it because you figure I got less days to live than I've already lived, and so I need to make sure my life is right with Christ. But it's not just about knowing who Jesus is. It's knowing about what Jesus does, can do, and will do in your life. Now, some of you know, for several years, almost 10, I worked in psychiatric hospitals. My job was to go around to different churches and places. I worked in a, in a Christian unit called Landmark Christian Psychiatry, and my job was to go around as a marketing person and share uh, with the preachers and churches that we had a place where people could get mental health care with a Christian focus. Now, some of the psychiatrists were Jewish, and uh, we never really asked them about that. They were not people trying to convert people to their religion. They were trying to get people to honor their own faith. And unfortunately, a lot of the places I went, I heard from pastors, there's no such thing as mental illness. If people just had Jesus, they'd be fine. Well, I, officially, I guess, I joined Alcoholics Anonymous about 33 years ago. I drank a little bit before that, as you might imagine. I never didn't have Jesus. Having Jesus wasn't the solution. It was knowing what Jesus could do for my life. And so now, me, like a whole lot of other people that have been to AA or NA or Weight Watchers, I can say, by the grace of God and an organization like AA, I have 33 years sober. I couldn't have done it alone. What I submit to you now is that we right now in this next few weeks before Christmas need to reflect on our own lives. What difference will it make for Jesus to come once again into our lives on December the 25th? Because it should be transformative. No matter who you are or where you are or what you have done, we can be closer to Christ. We can have our eyes open. We can be more aware of the needs in our community. The needs in our families, the needs among our faith community, and the need that people outside of our faith community need to be in one. It's different than being in the Rotary Club or the Kiwanis. It's different than that. The kind of grace that happens in a, in a faith family is that kind of grace that it just doesn't make any sense even sometimes how people care about you, they notice you, they want to know if you're okay, they ask questions about you, and they miss you when you're not there. So as I began to look at Advent maybe in a new and different way this year, I kind of felt like that, that person that goes into their first AA meeting where it says, says, I realize that my life has become unmanageable. I wonder what it would be like for us Christians just for the next four weeks to realize that our lives are unmanageable. We're not much different than the folks way back in the Old Testament. They wanted a solution from a king. They wanted some fleshly person, a human, to fix it. They wanted things to be better, the economy to be better. They wanted all the same stuff we do. And time and time again, God called them and said, follow me and your problems will become less. Oh, people still were hungry. People still didn't have enough money, but they had a different focus. Some of the most generous people I've ever known were some of the poorest. Because they had their focus in the place where they could do all they could do. Not, not giving out of extravagance or, or giving out of some extra money they had there or, or even time or treasure. But giving because they felt a calling by God to do more for their community. We have a young lady, she's traveling this weekend because of holiday weekend. She's a junior in high school. Uh, she answered that call. Most of you know about this by now, but she answered the call. She was a, a student at Gearburg High School. She called me and said, what can we do to make a difference in our community? Well, actually, she called and said, I have an idea of something we can do to make a difference in our community. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, 
uh, it's getting cold and people are cold and people need blankets and coats. And what if, what if, I'm a member of the National Honor Society in our high school, what if, what if I went to them and said we could collect some clothes? Would it be okay if we, we need to have a way, the, the school can't really do it, can we, can we go to the church, our church, and, and sort the clothes and take them to places like New Hope Women's Center or Sarah's House or the bridge? Or if failing that, take them down to Dowling Street and Converse Street, downtown Congress, and hand them out to homeless people. Now, i got to tell you, I, there's a lot of things, if you don't know me well, I try never to say no. Sometimes I say maybe. But when I got a, a junior high school, I mean a junior, junior in high school coming to me wanting to serve God in that way, there's no way I can say no. So they collected a bunch. We got them in a room back there. We've sorted some. They came and helped sort some. Her mama took a bunch to, she works off of Family Street in the women's hospital. She took a bunch of them to the people that are homeless, that are on the street, and gave them blankets and coats. We've got a whole bunch more clothes to go, and we'll be trying to hand those out between now and Christmas. You see, I think that's what understanding Advent means. What are the things that I need to do that I've not done? How can I do these things? How can I join in? And, I, and I'm going to tell you, I'm a human like everybody else. I looked at that room and said, oh my God, we got a lot of clothes we got to look at. But you know what? The difference it'll make in somebody else's life is way more important than the inconvenience it is to us. Amen. I was reminded yesterday when I was talking to some friends about how life is different because of choices that we make. Have y'all ever thought about that? The forks in the road where you pick the wrong one? <laughs> you see, I think God was still with you. I don't think God is going to direct us. We live in a, in a free society. We can choose to worship God or not. But even when you make the wrong choice, at least in my experience, it seems funny how, how you make that choice and it was the wrong one, and yet God seems to nudge you back to this other place. I mean, there are lifestyles and people I hung out with that did. If I would have not gone into the ministry, it might have affected a lot of things. If I wouldn't have met my wife, Kathy, I, we, who knows? I might be down here at moments this morning. I don't know. That's a cabaret around the corner for those of you. <laughs> really, I, I don't know what I would have been like if circumstances hadn't worked out. Now, I'm going to tell you, I believe God would play a role in those choices. But they were not always through likely ways that you would think they would happen. I mean, there was not a big halo that came over and said, oh, you need to meet Kathy. It didn't happen. And the way we got involved in the church, it wasn't one of those normal things where you just kind of go and, and you sort of get absorbed into the church. It was a conscious decision we made because she had some friends, not many, a few, and I had some friends, not many and a few, but a few, and some of them we didn't really care that much for on either side. So we said, why don't we go make new friends in a new place? And we did. Now, everybody we met and people we want to hang out with every weekend. Let me just tell you. But we made a bunch of friends that have been lifelong connections that we made. We have made uh, things that, that had a, a, a way of aiming the trajectory of our lives into a particular place. I mean, little things. I was the lay leader at LaPorte United Methodist Church, First Methodist support. We got a new preacher. His name is Danny Wayman. Danny came, and uh, right away he called me aside, and he said, let me just tell you a couple of things about me and the way I do church. I said, okay, you're the boss. He said, uh, laity Sunday doesn't mean it's amateur hour. Don't count on preaching. Hey, I wasn't really that big on preaching anyway, so it was okay with me. Time goes along. We get closer to laity Sunday. He knew me better. He said, well, maybe it would be a good idea for you to go and deliver the message on laity Sunday. He didn't tell me that his mother and dad, who was a district superintendent in the Free Methodist Church, were going to be sitting on the front row. He didn't tell me that the scripture that I was going to need to preach out of was about speaking in tongues. But I waved it through. I remember because we had dinner after church that day and I sat next to Danny's mother and she said, you handled that pretty well. About 3.30 in the afternoon, the phone rang. 
And Danny said, can you meet me at Burger King? We're going to get a Coke. And he said, actually, that was a pretty good message. He said, have you ever thought about going into the ministry? I said, well, yeah. I said, I thought about it when I was, my grandmother said when I was six, I was headed there. and I thought about it a bunch of times. But you know, it requires going to seminary. And, 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 and I, at the time, I really thought about it. My, I was a single dad, and I had a six and an eight-year-old. And, and it would be driving off to Dallas for classes because our seminary is it, it, it's not in Houston. And, and I said, I just couldn't figure out how to make it work. I, was, I started it out, and, and then I got a really good job, and I sort of blew it off. It's okay. He's left it right there. So Kathy and I went on a mission trip to Costa Rica. We thought it was a vacation. We're good Methodists. We're going to go down there, write some checks, hang out. We had to use picks and shovels in 100 degree heat and move 35 cubic yards of volcanic rock to level the floor for a church that was being built. It was not a vacation. On the way back, we were chaperoned by a couple of preachers, the elders in the United Methodist Church that were working at the seminary there in San Juan, or San Jose, whatever town that is. And uh, Kathy said, well, you know, if you could be a preacher like that, that would be so bad. So I came home and thought about it a little bit. A lot of stuff happened in our life. Uh, my dad died. Uh, in 2001, and this is all about that time. And I made a kind of offhand comment to the preacher. I said, well, I would uh, I would consider going to seminary and stuff, but, you know, I wouldn't be able to do this secular job I have. I work 80 hours a week. It's all about money and working and work ethic. I said, I'd, I'd you know, probably need a job like at the church or something, you know, where I could have an office and a place to study. <laughs> and a couple days later, he called me and said, Staff Parish Relations wants to hire you. I quit my job, went to work for the church. And there's a whole different story how I finally got into seminary, but I did. I fully expected, fully expected that I would be appointed to a church like the one in Pine Hill. And if y'all never been there, it's between Minden and Henderson, uh, I think. Is that right? Close enough. Close enough. It's a little white church. You could put the whole facility in this room. Uh, probably has 20 members. And, and so I'm thinking, you know, it was a good thing for my ego. I, I thought, I'll never be that important. But God's calling me. I'm going to do this. And so we were, we talked at length about what it would be like for me to be living there and Kathy to keep her job in Houston because she wasn't moving. And then Bishop Huey came and she talked about starting new churches. And I thought for the first time in my life I had an opportunity to be a part of a church that didn't think it was better than the other churches, that didn't welcome anybody, that was able to share troubles and discussions. And right now, for Advent, it's a time when I think we can reflect on where we've been and where we need to be. As I talked at that wedding with some longtime Methodists, we all agreed the world has changed since the 50s when this building was built. Church is going to have to be different. And we don't have to give up traditions. We're not going to do that. We can still sing the glory of pottery and collect the offering and sing the doxology and sing mostly hymns. Sometimes we might have a guitar. You never know. What you don't know, if you haven't been here for a long time, is we used to have pews in here, and it was art paneling around here, and it wasn't a very welcoming place, but it's welcoming today. And I know that there are people in our community right now that are looking for a place to have a relationship with Jesus Christ alongside of us. We're all on that same journey together. Some of us may be further along. I, I really like hanging out with people that are more spiritual than me, and so that's why I hang out with most of you. Sometimes I'm not that reverent. <laughs> in 2009, I got introduced as the, at the Kiwanis Prayer Breakfast as the Minister of the Year. I was introduced as the long-haired, Harley-riding preacher. 
I really didn't intend to keep long hair very long, but then it kept going, and people kept coming, and we kept doing stuff. I, I went and talked to the BS. I said, man, annual conference is coming up. I better get me a close cut haircut, get me a new suit. And he said, well, how did the people look, how did you look when the people came to the church? I said, well, like this. He said, then why would you look different than that? He, he, they talked to me one time about going to a different church, and I said, well, if I went to that church, I'd probably have to cut my hair. And he said, if they wanted you to cut your hair, it would probably say more about them than it did about you. Amen. Advent gives us a chance to reflect on who we are. Kind of like that alcoholic that has to say their life is unmanageable. Maybe as Christians, we need to understand our life is unmanageable too. And through Jesus Christ, we can find ways to survive it, to suffer through it, to get through it, to, to have a life that leads us into something bigger, better, and stronger. And I don't know what that's always going to look like because I'm amazed to hear people talk about the ways that God has changed their life. So as we go into week two of that, then reflect a little bit on decisions you made where you might be if you'd have made a different one. Who else would it maybe have affected? What are the ways that your life right now exemplifies Jesus Christ and how that has in some way reflected to, bounced off of, been in the lives of others? So when I say, are we ready? Are we ready? I mean, are we really ready? Are we ready to be representatives of the kingdom? I think not. But when Christ comes, when we once again celebrate that birth that we celebrate on December 25th, can we can be ready to accept Him, to love Him, and to understand that there is plenty of sin in this world. It abounds. But grace abounds more. And it's the love, mercy, and grace of Jesus Christ that can unite us, can strengthen us, and can empower us. Not to wait till we die to go to heaven, but to experience heaven right now on earth. Somebody down off a famine street had a warm blanket. Some kid that we don't know who has parents that are in prison for we don't know what is going to get a present on behalf of that parent that that parent couldn't do. You see, I think that's kingdom work. That's the stuff we can be united about. We can be ready to make a difference in a kingdom that is hurting, that's in pain, suffering. Paul describes it as the pain of birth when he talks about it. And I submit to you, that's kind of where we are now. We're in that, that the birth pangs that happen before that baby is born, that, that discomfort, but there's joy coming. It's coming. There's nothing like holding that little newborn baby in your arms and you don't even realize what a mess it's going to make of your life. Amen. Changes everything. But it's still joy. And I believe that's the birth we're looking for as a congregation, as a community, as a denomination as we come toward Christmas this year. Self-reflection. Where are you? Do you need Jesus? I do. I do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, you're going to look at this next hymn, which is the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and you're going to say, why are we singing that during that hymn? Well, we're only going to sing three verses. And Johnny, I've got it said. If you use the space bar, it should just automatically skip the two we're not singing. We're going to sing first, third, and fifth verse. Pay attention to the words. I think you'll see why we're singing that during Advent. As you're able, would you please stand as we sing our closing hymn today. If today would be the day you unite with our church, you can come forward. Uh, you can always unite here by baptism, by profession of faith, by transfer from another church, another denomination. We welcome you to come as we stand and sing. Yeah. 
to the hospital. I thought it was Dead Man Street, but anyway. Uh, anyway, she lives right across from, uh, well, I'm not going to tell them exactly where. They might come see you. That's okay. <laughs> right across from uh, Andy's Wild Hog Barbecue. And Carol is a long time. She was an Evangelical United Brethren until 1968. And then she became a United Methodist because we joined together and absorbed each other. That's a question we'll have on a trivia one day. That simply is the German branch of the Methodist Church in, in, in reality. Not much difference really, is there? So she's been a member of another Methodist Church here in our community for a long time. That church is disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church. So she needs a home and she thinks she's found one here. We're so happy to have her. This is Carol Walsh. All I need to do is ask you, will you be, uh, will you be supportive of this church with your prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness? And we are good to go. Would y'all welcome Carol as we give her a new move of how about that? Now, uh, Carol, what I'm going to ask you to do is, Uncle Sue, would you go stand with her by in the back in the middle so people can, uh, I, wanna, I was the first to welcome her. I knew about this ahead of time. But Sue, if you would stand with her and introduce her to others as they come, as you go from this place today, let us welcome her uh, as a part of our faith community. And as soon as she gets in place, then the rest of you, if you will, stand. Friends, it is the love of Jesus Christ, His mercy and grace, that bring us together as a united community called the children of God. Go forth from this place. Let your house be a place where love and mercy are the most generous things you have. For others are greeted, for others are welcome. We do that all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.